Over the last 40 years, technology has developed with dizzying speed. But how has technology changed us? How has it transformed our homes? And what has it done to our families? To find out, the Sullivan Barnes family are taking part in a unique experiment. They've been stripped of all their modern technology. And their own home has been turned into a time machine. What on earth have they done with our kitchen? What do you think? Already, they've lived through the digital wilderness of the 1970s. Black and white! They're fast-forwarding through the years at the rate of one a day. Now, they're entering the 80s. But can modern kids get to grips with prehistoric electronics? Wait, wait, wait. Why, why can't you be more patient? Nothing ever works. And will the 80s bring them labour-saving must-haves or time-wasting boys' toys? Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> it working! Has progress always been for the better? And has it fulfilled our electric dreams? One household in Reading, it's still the 1970s. But not for much longer. And that's a relief for some of them. I have to say the technology's been pretty poor. For self-confessed gadget freak Adam, the 80s have got to be better than the decade he's just lived through. What a total waste of time. What on earth were they thinking? Though Mum George's faced challenges too, she feels the simpler life of the 70s had its upside. We've really spent quite a lot of time round the table as a family. That's partly because the kids haven't been kept busy by their usual electronic gadgets. Adam's daughter, Steph, and George's children, Hamish and Ellie, have no idea what lies ahead for them in the 1980s. Nor does two-year-old Jude. Not surprising, really. Even the eldest wasn't born until 1995. I don't know what to expect, really. I hope our 80s lifestyle doesn't mean that everybody's got massive distractions. Can their newfound closeness survive the coming onslaught of 80s electronics? <music> Elsewhere in Reading, the family's very own technical support team are assembling vintage 80s equipment. Gia Milinovic is a technology writer with a lifelong passion for computing. Well, this is when things get very exciting for me. Obviously, this is the first time that computers make it into the home, and there's loads to choose from. They may cause the family some problems, however, because they're not quite as easy to use as modern computers. Tom Rigglesworth is in charge of all audio and communications devices. It's going to be a busy decade for him. In the 1980s, consumer electronics were getting smaller, more personal and more portable. It meant for the first time you could live in a world of your own. To put it all in context, Dr Ben Highmore is a sociologist who specialises in the history of domestic technology. This technology gets sold to people as being convenient, labour-saving. How labour-saving was it? And as they prepare 80s equipment to send into the family home, the team face a constant challenge. This era's technology often went wrong, and when it broke, it was hard to fix. A new family, a world, we are family. The family's been dressed up for the 80s. And they're about to find out how their house has been similarly transformed. For many people in this decade, home became increasingly important, as more time and money was spent there. Oh, wow. <laughs> The digital age has arrived. Hey, look at and as the new Conservative government exhorted Britons to buy their houses, Laura Ashley was telling us how to decorate them. Very tasteless, really. It's just, you know, the, the whole flowery stuff just drives me bonkers. 
Though they're marching into the digital future, their decor's heading in the other direction. This COD historical style was nostalgic for less high-tech times. It looks a lot like a granny home or a great aunt or something. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that one. And look at that. Is that an answer machine? In 1980, machine. Britain's phone system was still run by the post office. And many people had only ever seen an answering machine on the Rockford files. Hello, family. Uh, welcome to your new house. I hope you like the uh, decor. I hope you like floral and draped. And uh, good luck with all the new technology that we've supplied you with, including the answer phone, which you've clearly found and mastered. See you soon. Bye. And a really nice stereo. Look at that. It's got all sorts. Complete leap of technology, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is proper separate hi-fi. This is, this is more like it. 80s appliances were less likely than their predecessors to be hidden away behind the doors of cabinets. The latest technology was a status symbol to be proudly displayed. Look how much thinner it is now. It was, yeah. the, it was a massive thing, wasn't it? I hope we have more channels than we did last time. I don't think you get another channel until 1982, staff. It's nice to have extra space spread out a little bit more. For a decade when building house extensions became common, the family have more space. In the 70s, this was the living room. But now a lounge has been created next door, it's a set-aside dining area. It's a little bit of a status thing, isn't it? I'm gonna impress people in here. But the kitchen's no bigger, and still a long way from high-tech chic. There has been some progress with the white goods. Yeah, we have, we have a, freezer. a freezer inside the house. Oh, wow, no, awesome. ceramic hob, Adam. Ooh. They're really difficult to clean. Go, go, go! <laughs> Upstairs, too, it's all change. Uh. <gasps> oh, my God, look at that! How completely cheesy is that? Oh, we've got an upstairs phone, darling. We can make private phone calls now. We've come from a decade where there's been nothing private about the phone. It's right in the middle of the house. Do you like the style of the phone? Yeah, I like it. That's it's very style. girly. The only bit of masculinity I can see in the house is that hi-fi. That feels really rugged and manly. Oh, oh my God, that's goodness! Oh. Ellie and Steph's room isn't exactly macho either. I love it. During the 80s, kids started to spend more time in their bedrooms. You freak me out. Ugh, they're horrible. <laughs> There was now more to keep them entertained upstairs. <laughs> hey, look, we've got a tape player. Yay, we didn't have any technology in our old room in the 70s. Hamish's room is littered with electronic toys. During the early 80s recession, much of Britain couldn't afford technology like this. But families with disposable income were increasingly spending it on their children. I think 1980s girls should go and be playing in their room with their little scary dolls and ponies. Oh, what are you doing it. with it? Yeah. Nothing. It is not your personal property. The other male of the family is also marking his territory. I'm absolutely convinced that the man in the house would have gone out and bought himself a decent hi-fi. The children of the house would not have been allowed near this kind of hi-fi kit because well, it would have been so it. expensive. Every, and, I would be. You might be. <laughs> no, I would be. No, you would be. I'm going to leave you to it, Bye. OK? You let me know when it's not working. Oh, please, God, may we be able to make it work. It's not working, girls. Is that... No, it's, it's, it's just a button we need to press. That needs to be on. Come on, you stupid thing. Everything's on. Ah. Good. I'm glad you managed to work it out. Yes. Don't touch it again without my permission. Back at the workshop, the tech team are preparing their first delivery. Microwave ovens are now found in over 90% of British homes. But in 1980, only 6% of households had one. A basic microwave then cost over 30 times more in real terms. 
And yet that wasn't the main reason they hadn't caught on. There was a real fear around them in the beginning of the 80s. So it's a slow and difficult take-up, even though the technology was available from the mid-70s. The radiation at the heart of microwave cookery sounded uncomfortably similar to radioactivity for many consumers at a time of widespread nuclear paranoia. Today, many scientists are worried that the safety levels aren't good enough. This fallacy was encouraged by a widely seen television program. Microwaves uh, can kill a person. Uh, for example, if uh, you had the intensity required uh, to cook something, you could cook a person. I was literally baked in a microwave oven. There's a host of unknown consequences, including cancer, birth defects, things of this sort. UK microwave sales plummeted immediately after the documentary aired. Potential purchasers were particularly anxious that radiation would somehow escape through the oven's walls or door. I suggest we give them this, a microwave leakage detector. <laughs> Knowing that the safety fears eventually proved groundless, the tech team dispatched the oven to the house. God, it's heavy. The family's challenge is to use their delivery as a household would have done in 1980. At that time, microwaves were being sold as the time-saving replacement for the traditional oven. So we've got to do a menu for tonight created entirely with the microwave oven. An exciting prospect for anybody about to embark on it. But first, following commonplace advice in 1980, the family makes sure the oven won't cook them. If it gets into the bed, it's dangerous. Run for your life. I've heard before that you, this can be harmful standing in front of the microwave. Who told you that? You. Oh, well, there you go, see, because I heard that when I was first using microwaves, so I probably just passed on the big fib. It's fine. What's all the fuss about? <laughs> okay. There might be meals that you could do quite nicely. <laughs> Many cookbooks were published at the time dedicated solely to the new art of microwave cuisine. They promised food which not only cooked much faster, but also tasted better. Some of my dinner guests have exclaimed that my microwave cooked vegetables are the best they've ever tasted. What are we making for dinner then? Roast chicken in the microwave. Even the most evangelical cookbooks had to admit microwaves couldn't brown meat or poultry. They suggested slavering your roast in ketchup, gravy mix, or paprika. It's to give it a bit of colour to try and persuade yourself that it looks a bit more something akin to the colour bird that you're used to eating from an oven. Roast. So I guess that's the fella. Of course, only one dish at a time can fit into the microwave. So none of the trimmings George is preparing can begin cooking till the chicken's completed its 40-minute spin. All right, chicken. It looks like fake tan that's had a bit of time sweating on the dance floor. Microwaves were even recommended for baking, so making pudding should be a piece of cake. Wow, that is funky. Let's go. It's good being able to see it, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Only when every single dish has had its moment in the oven can the family finally have their dinner. Is that nice, Jude? Mm. Oh, delicious. Of course you are. I looked at my watch at 20 past six and thought, 40 minutes, brilliant, we'll be eating at seven. 8.52 on my digital watch. Nearly nine o'clock. Let's be honest, throwing a, throwing a chicken in the oven with a few roast potatoes is at least as easy and probably less, less bother. I'm surprised that this actually tastes... If you're not eating the skin, absolutely fine. Not as nice as the oven, but it's not horrible. It's better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Though the cake looks the business, the proof of a pudding traditionally lies elsewhere. Yeah. Almost like it's a stale cake. Into radiation. Kind of rock solid. It's almost like it's not cooked evenly all the way through, is it? It's classic microwave cooking, really, isn't it? Where it tends to heat one part of the dish more than another the family won't be chucking out their regular oven just yet. Right in the middle. <laughs> the kids end their first day in the 80s by settling down in front of the new TV. There's one novelty waiting for them. Oh, it's massive. It's huge. It's, it's like, heavy. It's quite heavy. It's quite heavy for a It'll be like a mobile phone. 
Yeah. Hello? I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. This is another wrong type. The links are far too fine. The hair gets through. Since only 2% of households had video recorders in 1980, this was as much control over the TV as most people had. Master will explain. With a new day comes a new year. And a new delivery from the tech team. An increasing amount of technology in the 80s was designed to entertain us. This is huge one. It's fake. No matter how young. <gasps> oh! It says spell. Ah. ah. Can you find out? The yellow one. Speak and spell cost £120 in today's money, but sold well because parents could be persuaded it was educational. For the older kids, the primitive ancestors of the world's best selling handheld electronic games. Well, that's Nintendo. <laughs> I didn't think they'd be around in the 1980s. I don't get what you're supposed to do. So it's not very good compared to the games in 2009, but since we don't have that, then it's good enough. <laughs> Hamish quickly figures out the benefits of having pocket-sized tech. It's mine, and it belongs to me, so nobody else has the right to play it. Dad's new toy would have cost nearly £300 in today's money. Ah, wow. The Sony Walkman, look. Look how big that is, guys. For the look. same amount in 2009, he could buy two MP3 players with room for 60,000 songs. Ah. Solid state. Oh, 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 lovely, though. A new Polaroid. They're all rapidly silenced by their individual gizmos. Even Jude. Where are you going? Sony launched the world's first personal stereo in the dying months of the 70s. The designers initially worried it was antisocial, so early Walkmans were fitted with two headphone sockets. As it turned out, we all loved being cut off from the world around us. Soon every other manufacturer brought out their own version of the Walkman. So much better than having nothing. <laughs> having something like this to take take my mind away from the the boredom of it is 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 a must. I, I find it difficult. I don't think I'd do as much exercise without some entertainment. It's not one of those things that you need to have, but it sure is nice to have. In the decade where Margaret Thatcher would claim there was no such thing as society, the family are already enjoying technology they don't have to share. In the 70s, you'd like play together rather than playing on your own or something. But now, because they brought in like this kind of thing and um, tape players, you can go on off on your own. It's good to have your own like kind of bubble, <laughs> and you can do what you want really, instead of all being together at the same time, which is kind of gets a bit annoying. <laughs> While most of the economy was deep in recession, British computing was a miraculous exception. A manufacturing industry that wasn't sacking everyone. If it's got a keyboard, a manual and computer written on it, it'll sell. That's the word around the exploding market for personal or home computers that simply plug into a television set. We're the world's largest producer of computers. We make more than the whole nation of Japan put together. Technological innovation had met 80s entrepreneurialism. The perfect mix for a leader who was a science graduate as well as a free market evangelist. Prime Minister, this is a small home computer. The Sullivan Barnes family are going to experience microcomputer mania. So the tech team needs to check up on the choice available in 1982. 
Jia's come to meet Simon Webb from the National Museum of Computing. We've got about 3,000 items in the collection. From this vast array, they select a few models of the right vintage. Some faded rapidly into obscurity. There's a Dragon there, Dragon 32. This was a Welsh company that produced this. Others, however, found their way into millions of homes. What made a machine successful was the availability of software, and this is where machines like Spectrum sort of won out, because there were a huge number of software titles available for it. The Spectrum's main British rival was made by Acorn. Although it cost three times as much, it had heavyweight backing. The BBC branded it, and the government paid for one to go into every school in Britain. So I suppose the main issue with early 80s computers was that none of them were compatible. That's right. This was what really was unsustainable. Everybody doing their own thing. So it wasn't until the IBM PC really sort of established a standard that all these machines started sort of dying out, you know. Navigating a path through such incompatible hardware was often tricky. But the Sullivan Barnes family will have to make this tough choice, just as early 80s consumers did. Gia set up a computer fair for them. This is the astonishing new ZX Spectrum, full eight colors sound generation, high resolution graphics. High resolution. Okay. All of these machines had much less memory and power than a modern mobile phone at a much higher price. Even the cheapest Spectrum cost over 300 pounds in today's money. While the model the BBC kept plugging would have set you back a whopping 900 quid for 32K. Gia's invited some guests to help the family decide. Simon Munnery is now a professional comedian, but in the 80s published software for the ZX Spectrum. It still works. How do you stop it? Patrick Bossert preferred the BBC Micro. He wrote a book about programming when he was a teenager. As a follow-up to his bestseller, You Can Do The Cube. You're a whiz kid in this area. Now, what's happening here? Uh, well, you're controlling a car. It's a racetrack. Ah, then you've crashed. I think you should buy the BBC computer because you'll have a lot of fun out of it. It's got tremendous games, but when you get bored of playing the games, there's so much more you can do beyond it. Things like word processor and good software, for ju just for doing letters and business stuff. I recommend this Sinclair ZX Spectrum, partly because it's cheap and so many people have it, and there are so many people out there writing games for it. The Spectrum's very good fun for games. It's effectively a, a toy. The BBC computer, it's got, it's got the, the stench of school about it. But most of the games will be fun with counting or um, isn't geography nice, that sort of thing. So uh, much better to stick with Sinclair, have fun, and uh, let education worry about itself. Simon's Spectrum is definitely sounding cooler. But Patrick wins back the family's attention by demonstrating some of his old programming skills. And then when you tell it to run that. Wow. What he's written is basic in both senses of the word. But it's enough to intrigue the kids. It's simple stuff, but it's worth a go. All right, guys, I brought you here to choose one computer. Which one do you want to choose? BBC. Which one do you want to choose? BBC. Oh. Which one? BBC. It's your decision. I was going to say the BBC, actually. I'm really surprised because in, in the 80s, kids really just wanted the spectrum. And it was kind of seen as being a bit, you know, swatty to have the BBC micro. But look at Hamish, he's, he's not even paying attention to this. <laughs> he's just programming. It's got games and word processing as well, and you can print things off or something. So, and, you, and Hamish quotes like some, um, what was it? Uh, processing, I think it's called. But a home computer is not what everyone in the house wants. George is worried the kids will spend as much time on it as they do on their modern PCs. I guess it depends how capable the computer is, but if it's got computer games, I think that will be, that will be the first start down the slippery slope to, to the kids regressing back to, to the noughties. Clap. 
That Everything's that just that fine as it is. That did do it. Go on, did you permission to sit? get it in and we'll go. Oh, you permission to sit? Where, where do you think it should go? Put it in my bedroom. I wouldn't not let you play on it in the my bedroom. No, it's not going in your bedroom. No question of it going in your bedroom. I'd like it in the spare room. You've got to put it somewhere where everybody can use it. Spare room! Spare room. It, won't, it won't fit on that desk. You, why can't it be on there? Because I want to be able to sit and relax in this room without having a computer here. There's enough gadgets in this room already. The decision is spare room, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's just a weird room. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's the data loading device. I want to load a software, which is cool. And an instruction manual. I haven't got a monitor, have we? Definitely need a monitor. Call the tech team. Hi, Simish. We need a monitor for the computer. The tech team have to break the news that the average family in 1982 plugged the computer into the TV. OK, then. OK, thanks. Bye. A dedicated monitor then costs more than most computers. They said you have to plug it into the TV. Oh, stop there, no, <laughs> no. You'll have to but take you it back. Can unplug it and put it in the cupboard where you don't use it. No. But mm, well, that's not an option. I'd rather you put the TV upstairs. From my room? No, <laughs> absolutely no. I think we should have. Computer, but we'll, we'll, I think it's relatively easy to unplug and plug. It is. It's literally just like plug, pull out the cord. It's not oh. like there's anything to watch on the television anyway, is there? OK, well, I think my vote's quite clear, so I'll let you vote. Okay. Do we have the computer down here or do we take the TV upstairs to the computer and don't have a TV down here? Well, TV those are the choices. Staying downstairs. The sitting room's quickly taken over by the boy's new toy. Right, should we do the typical boy thing and just plug it in, or should we read the guide? I'm not particularly interested to watch the computer being installed. It has to be in the sitting room. I'm not very pleased about it, but, I, I, you know, I'm resigned to it. It's, that's how it's going to be. We won't be playing it. Uh, because yeah, because Hamish and Dad will be dominating it. And Dad will say, the man of the house would normally have the computer. Yes. Hamish can't wait to show the computer off to his school friend Dan. Put that there. Since it's not allowed to stay out overnight, that means setting up the hardware all over again. <laughs> Look, it's a masterpiece. The common belief in the early 80s was that to use computers, everyone would need to learn programming. What? Instead, by the time these teenagers were born, many tasks require little more than a click of a mouse. Oh, 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 this, this one's gone. Oh, no, I need to my Wait, wait. Yes. Yeah. Yet, surprisingly, Hamish is more excited by the prehistoric micro than any of the technology he encountered in the 70s. Comma, one, and then press return. Like her mum, Ellie can't see the point. Zero, zero. I have no um, idea what they're party. doing. Anyway, sound. Oh, good. Comma one. Electronics weren't just found in the home in the early 80s. They were saturating every aspect of popular culture. Good evening, Ali. Good evening, Steph. Hello. So 1983's delivery from the tech team is the technology which soundtracked the era, the synthesizer. It, it means nothing to me, this. So I've got a couple of chaps um, outside I'd like you to meet who will be able to explain a lot more. How it works. How it works, yeah. Oh, great. Just give me one second. OK. Yes, playing live tonight in Adam and George's dining room the keyboard players from one of the most successful synth-pop groups of the decade. Hi, family. It's Chris Cross and Billy Cooey from Ultravox. No! <laughs> These guys were our idols. Absolutely <laughs> got smacked by that. Though Adam was a huge fan, 
they don't mean as much if you weren't even born at the time. In 1983, we started doing bass sounds like that. Know, that kind of thing but with a drum machine it was so new yeah so it was that exciting <laughs> you that, that, that yes <laughs> that i do <laughs> Ultravox broke new ground, not only with their synthesized sound, but also with their visuals. As well as ostentatious pop videos, the 80s brought the world the satellite network to show them on, MTV. We made our own videos and it was really new. Our music was... It's quite, quite a film to start with, but that was a, a, a real big shift in, in uh, records were, were sort of promoted. And, and, the, and these guys made some great videos. Um, so you, you kids have got a challenge for this decade. You've got to make your own pop video. Mm. With what? With what? Exactly. We haven't got a Not camera. Yet. Not, yet. Not yet you haven't, it's only 1983. By the end of the decade, you will have enough. I'll, I'll give you enough things to make your own pop video. The good thing in the eighties was everyone used to mime. <laughs> <laughs> it was so surreal having two absolute eighties music icons in our house. That sounds like Indian. <laughs> Ellie gradually started to catch on what a big, big deal it was. Because we were so Steph. awestruck. Don't think Hamish and Steph gave a no, they didn't hoot. Even monkeys, did they? So we just had half a pop band in our house, isn't that pretty cool? It's cool, but I have no clue who on earth they were. It's like in the television. 40 years and we have kids and we're just like, oh, these are the people from Scouting for Girls, <laughs> you know? And they were just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> As Britain reached the year of Orwell's nightmare, Big Brother wasn't watching us, yet. But we were watching more. Television was now broadcasting at breakfast time and on a fourth channel. And technology was giving us far more choice over what we watched and when. A video cassette recorder was now found in almost a third of British households, even though just as with home computers, consumers were caught in the crossfire between conflicting technologies. The real video war isn't fought against invaders from outer space. It's battled out on the high streets of Britain. It's all a matter of format. The tech team have to decide which tape format the family will get. With hindsight, VHS clearly seems the most future-proof choice, but back in 1984, Betamax still held a quarter of the market. Hello. Hello, I'm Tia. Hi, Andy. Andy Hayne has pieced together an entire history of the video recorder, and he keeps it in his garden shed. Wow. Oh, my goodness. It's nice to know uh, someone who knows what they're looking at. Andy currently has 74 machines, and not just the two formats everyone remembers. He also has a staggering 19 alternatives, such as the LaserDisc player. Just amazing technology. There's a great big laser tube in there. It's not a solid state laser, it's a gas laser. So it's a huge, great laser tube inside. Very rare because there's very few of those still working in the world that I know of. What other formats were there in the well, 80s? Philips developed the Video 2000, and these used tapes that you could turn over. So right from the start, you had three hours on a side. Uh, so six that. hours total. Do you have a, a tape? They're pretty much the same size as a VHS cassette. It looks like a audio cassette and I'm very tiny. Well, in fact, Philips invented the audio cassette as well, so ah, okay. this was their video equivalent of an audio cassette. Right. By the time they got to the market, VHS and Beta were already fighting their war and they kind of ended up being also ran. Everyone knows the story that Betamax was the, its superior quality, but VHS won out. What's your take on that whole thing? It was largely marketing. The Sony Betamax, they presented it as a quality system. VHS was a little bit more aimed at the average man in the street. And when you're talking about hundreds of pounds, thousands of pounds in today's money, there was obviously a temptation to rent if there was two formats fighting. VHS was easier to rent, the tapes were easier to rent, and that became popular, and uh, it very quickly pushed Betamax down. And so, w was there actually a difference between the picture quality between the two of them? 
Uh, in a laboratory, yes. For the average person, probably not, no. The logical choice, then, in 1984, is the VHS. <laughs> when the tech team send their choice to the house, they add an extra video treat for the kids. Oh, wow! It's one of the very first camcorders from the firm that invented VHS. Dim's being cameraman, and you two can be like the pop girls. There's 136 pages of instructions, so seeing as you want to be the cameraman, there you go. Mammoth manuals became a common sight during the 80s. Though technology now offered advanced features, it hadn't yet cracked making them easy to use. Where's the on switch? And that bit goes somewhere. Uh, that's quite heavy. Ugh. <laughs> to test drive the video player, Ellie fetches a gift from the night before, Ultravox live in concert. Oh, it's smaller. Hopefully it still fits. Sideways a bit. Other way a bit. It's too small, Hamish. You know why it's too small, Ellie? Because that is a VHS and you're trying to put a Betamax in it. You know Blu-ray and normal nice. DVDs? Yes. You're not trying to put a Blu-ray into a normal DVD player. It's not going to work. Hi! The task of finding a tape the machine will actually play quickly gets passed on. I need to go and get a video. video. Any preference? For VHS. Something good. <laughs> Gear. Adam and his 80s escort may have quite a journey ahead of them. It feels quite strange to me, having got back from quite a long day of working, to be off in the car in search of a, of a film, when in modern day I'm a member of a DVD film club, so I get DVDs through the post, which is very good because you don't even have to go out from your door. But video rental shops were a boom business in the early 80s. The UK boasted precisely none at the start of the decade. A couple of years later, it had 25,000. As a result, many cinemas closed. I'm looking for VHS videos, films. Okay. Uh, we haven't done them for about three to four years. We've sort of gone out, DVD has taken over now, so we only stock DVD. I promised the kids I'd get them a film tonight because we've only just got a video recorder. Um, so that, is there anywhere around here I could possibly get one? I can't know. There's one other video shop we can go to. Might as well give that a go before we give up all hope. Dad is at the video shop still after about two hours literally because he doesn't have a phone with him we can't like call him up and say where are you we're a bit bored now adam's finally found an old independent store Hello. with no vhs tapes on its shelves either but the owner does keep a few under the counter it's ex rental stock he's selling off oh i'm just gonna get the pound each Back in 1984, very few people bought rather than rented. Buy those. Thank you very much. How much would that be? The average retail price then was £60. That's £150 in today's money. Kids! What is that? Shh, it's coming on. Shush. It's not coming on. It doesn't look any different to the screen look before you put it in, though, really, does it? Was it working earlier when we got it here? It was at one point. Ellie neglects to mention her earlier vigorous attempts to force a Betamax tape into the VHS machine. It's not going round, so there's clearly something not right with it. Yeah, you try pressing your button called play. Is it rewound? Nothing ever works. Yeah. Find out. No good. It's not working. Having spent all that time rushing around trying to get these videos and then for it not to work was a little bit of a letdown, to be honest with you. The next day, the tech team collect the broken machine for repair. Here you go. So, what's the um, problem? Well, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, 
the early VHS machines weren't incredibly reliable and and one of the suggestions was that you get it serviced every six months. Really? <laughs> really. Every six months? Every six months. In fact, 25% of VHS machines needed to be repaired in their first year of life. For other formats, the rate was even higher. Stick the uh, cable on the top. Oh, that is heavy. That is heavy. <laughs> but CPR for the VCR isn't the only reason Gia's come to call. OK, Adam, I've got you a surprise. Okay. I've got you a new set of wheels. Really? <laughs> now, that is good news. It is. OK, Adam, here's what we've got here. <laughs> that is unbelievable. I didn't think there would be that many that actually work still. There's so many! 1985 saw the launch of the C5, the most famous technological flop of the decade. Oh, man! <laughs> oh, God, man. Creating an electric vehicle had been the dream of Clive Sinclair long before he made his fortune with computers and calculators. We've got chaos on our, in our, on our roads. I don't believe that the forms of transport we have today can long survive. Sinclair's plan was to use the profits from the C5 to fund production of a full-sized electric car. But less than 17,000 were ever sold. These enthusiasts would like to persuade Adam their motors are more than just a retro joke. So what's his top speed? Around 15 miles an hour. You can get a little bit more if you really pedal crazy, but 15 is about the going rate. Why do you think it didn't succeed in 1985? If it had been released now, where, where cities have got more cycle paths and areas where you could actually use these sort of things, it might have been a different story to the one that turned out. You know, idea ahead of its time. So this is the 1985 vision of the future. Everyone has a C5, and I'm going to send you out shopping in one of these to get the um, experience of the future. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Adam quickly has to supplement the engine with pedal power. Twenty-five years later, climate change has put electric vehicles firmly back on the agenda. But the C5's visionary concept was let down by its execution, a common fault of 80s technology. You feel quite intimidated because you're so small in this traffic. I couldn't really see myself using this a full time, not in the main traffic. It was just, it was just too dangerous, I think. I just didn't feel safe. And then you kind of factor in the weather conditions in England. Why would you have this? I don't know. It's a shame, really, because it's really fun. Most people in 1985 came to the same conclusion. Whoever brought out that, well, wants putting up a wall and shooting. The failure of the C5 was proof that consumers were wising up about new technology. Clearly not everything innovative was worth buying. You can't go on. Nothing's wrong. Who's gonna drive you home tonight? Sinclair lost millions and had to sell his own name. We bought the Sinclair computer business. Uh, we bought the Sinclair brand name. Other British computer manufacturers had already gone bust. There was no place for eccentric innovators anymore. The last big British player in computing was Alan Sugar's Amstrad, and they outsourced their manufacturing to the Far East. That night, the family are sent an 80s invention which conquered the world, at least until MP3s came along. Um, um, we have a letter. It says, Dear Sullivan Barnes family, here's your compact disc player. The arrival of the CDs saw people getting rid of their records, so please remove yours and the turntable into the garage. Regards, the technical support team. 
I'm a bit sad to get rid of this, though. Dad, we're not going to use it. We have a CD player. Couldn't we just put it on top? No, we couldn't because it would break. I'm not happy to get rid of the vinyl because I know that that's a. Uh, it's got a, a different, richer sound. But once a new player is plugged in, Adam admits the advantages. I can remember getting my first CD player and, and being amazed at how I could just skip tracks and go backwards and forwards so quickly. I really like that. <laughs> dire Straits' 1985 album, Brothers in Arms, was the world's first million-selling compact disc. But it wasn't just the ability to hear protracted guitar riffs with crystal clear clarity that helped CDs take off. Lessons had been learned from the computer and video format wars. European and Japanese manufacturers have agreed on a single compatible system, so one maker's discs will play on another's machine. Sticking. Though with hindsight, not all the claims made for the new technology ring true. Make sure it's nicely spread around there. Bit of coffee. Anyone who's heard a CD jump due to a single fingerprint won't want to try this at home. A quick wipe down. Let's see how it sounds. Blue eyes. Think you're gonna miss the vinyl, Adam? It's my collection, you know. It's just nice to have them. It's just it's me, and I don't want to get rid of me, really. Full of me. Most Britons weren't so attached to their vinyl. By 1988, more CDs were being bought than records. Adam's collection is laid to rest in the garage, which is fast becoming a graveyard for discarded technology. Oh, what a shame. Never mind. Progress. Most of the LPs I've now got on CD because I went and bought them again. How stupid are we to go out and buy the same, the same music twice? The tech team have also sent back the video recorder. Is it working? Yeah! The tech team are guaranteed it's working. Any second now. Hear it. Yes. You can do that, please. Unlike the contentious computer, a video brings everyone together. You need to find the instructions for Sweetheart, though. Somewhere. There. There you go. There. The following night, Georgie is still full of praise for technology that, for once, enhances family life. Having the video recorder for us as a family is, is going to be a really good thing because we won't be scheduling the meals around the TV viewing times because there's a particular programme everybody wants to watch. We can video when it's on and, and watch it later because actually you know, this is time for us to sit down for a meal together as a family. Right now though the whole family clearly isn't together. The male side is noticeably absent from the kitchen. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that Adam's in the sitting room. He's been itching to get back to the computer, so... Just press... Wait, wait, wait! Why, did, why can't you be more patient? Why are you going to run? Just that you have to be patient, otherwise it definitely won't work. Mm. Five days after getting the micro, Adam and Hamish still haven't managed to load in any of the games, which are stored on cassettes. The appeal is the challenge. It's the, it's the man against machine thing. I'm not going to be beaten by this inferior technology. Star, hey. It's not capitals, we won't accept Oh, blast. But other members of the family aren't getting so much as a look in. Oh, stop. Oh, no, 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 stop, stop. That's what we do is we'll rewind the case and turn it up. No, I'm playing the computer. No, 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 no. Oh, searching. We're in. I haven't tried going on the computer yet because I'm doing other things. Too busy. They're not as interested in the computer, the girls. I mean, they do different things on the computers. So they're much more into kind of communication rather than playing games or something. Uh. 
several hours later, Adam finally gets a game to load. Yes! I was finding it quite frustrating that it wasn't working. You know, I think we've forgotten how how basic everything really was, how, you know, and how awkward things were. Turn it off now. No. But I thought the deal was that... You weren't going to have this out if I wanted to be in the sitting room, or...? If anyone wanted to watch Teddy or anything, that we'd put it away in the cupboard. It's taken five years to do this. I'd also forgotten how rubbish the games are. Some of the games really are so basic that they don't even have the retro appeal. Let's try that again. Oh, should we not try Disc. again? One, one more. We'll try one more. Oh, preliminary. Another night, another year. The second half of the decade is racing by. In a home with ever more technology, all the family have plenty to keep them busy. Oh, at last. What, what are you doing? It's my mum and Adam. Since there's still only one phone line, no conversation can be entirely private. Mummy's going to be late home. I'll see you later. Bye. With Georgie late back from work, there's no chance of a family dinner tonight. Fortunately, 1987 saw the launch of microwavable plastic. Chilled ready meals were a godsend for the increasing number of households where both parents worked. The microwave had finally found its true purpose in our kitchens. Oh, I'm supposed to let it stand for a minute, aren't I? Come on. I'll have it. I'm sure it'll be fine. But being able to eat at different times and in different places had a downside for family life. What a day. The last thing I want to eat now is this stuff. Mm -mm -mm. I like to eat as a family, and the idea of individual portions of not very nice food is really disappointing. <laughs> Technology designed to take less time can mean less time spent with other people. With 1988, the weekend arrives. Now then, how's your pop music? How's your decision making on pop music? What's the little otter thing? Mm. The kids are seeking inspiration from Saturday morning TV for the pop video they've got to make. Really weird, she looks so young. I have a really good idea. We'll go through the whole of like the routine of the day and like different scenes will just keep changing clothes like as we walk through different rooms, yeah. we pause it. We pause it and then we change and then we come in again. What I want you to do is I want you to be the same just in the parts so it's not like Steph goes halfway and then you start coming. Get closer ready, get closer. Okay. Go. Hamish is clearly confident about directing, as well as how to use the camcorder. OK, stay where you are, Steph. Stay. And you come a bit more. Mastering an unfamiliar and antiquated piece of technology apparently isn't hard for a young and curious mind. No, you need to be alongside so you can high-five. Steph, all you have to do is this. It's not hard. Getting your sisters to do as they're told is an altogether bigger challenge. Just stop. Just stop and high-five. Nineteen eighty-nine. As the last day of the decade begins, the family are preparing to host a dinner party. Let me have a pen and paper to write down the recipe. Oh, quick! Hold that. I really want this recipe. George's surfing teletext. The closest eighties homes came to the World Wide Web. As well as Cfax cuisine, the dinner guests will also be treated to the kids' pop video. That's provided the family work out how to connect the camcorder to the TV. That does not exist, that cover. They've come to realise that moments like these were an inevitable byproduct of this decade's designs. The most annoying thing and the most frustrating thing about the 80s technology has been that nothing works and it's really annoying. There's the bit that I mean. We do take things for granted in 2009 because you just kind of plug it in and turn it on and then it works rather than having to program it or 
do like or fiddle with all the switches or anything like that. We certainly sent in a lot. And as the tech team reflect on their 80s experience, they've come to the same conclusion. It wasn't really plug and play in the 1980s. <laughs> the ideas and concepts of the technology was there, but the hardware wasn't actually up to speed. And the early adopters were just left banging their head against the wall. It's not this cable, is it? No, no, just let me look at the photo. Let me look at the photo. Throughout the decade, the boys have been noticeably more hands-on with technology. A gender gap has opened in the home. So it's near the cable at the bottom. The technology itself becomes time-consuming, just the attention and, and care that you need to put into it to make it work. Perhaps Georgie isn't interested in technology in the 80s because she's, she's kind of waiting for it to do something that she, she actually wants it to do. Yes, I mean, one of the things in the 80s that they talked about was a big gender divide around technology. Technology really was just about the hardware and it wasn't about socialising, which it is about today. And women are much more interested in the social side of technology, connecting with other people. Tonight's social event happily has something for the whole family. The premiere of the kids' 80s epic. Ready? <laughs> the 80s child is quite good, actually, to be honest. It wasn't bad. And it wasn't as boring as the 70s. What's your Are you worried about mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. The 80s has been a lot more similar to the 2000s, but we still have a long way to go. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Then the kids are packed off upstairs so the adults can indulge in the 80s ritual of the formal dinner party. So it seems appropriate now to make a toast, so here's to the 1980s. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for coming. And at least for one member of the family, any hardware hassle has been compensated for by the chance to revisit his salad days. This was technology that I was awestruck by 20 years ago. I thought it was fantastic. The reality of it is, is that it's been it's been a bit rubbish, really. <laughs> but it's been fun investigating it and fun hitting it, banging it, and getting frustrated with it. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thanks for coming. Bye. Safe home. Next time, the family experiences the communications revolution of the 90s. <gasps> it works! <laughs> but as the pace of change goes into overdrive... Oh, blimey, not another one. <laughs> what price family life? This is what I've been dreading. Lots of different entertainment media choices around the house and everybody being off doing their own thing. Huge! Oh! And you can continue your journey through the decades online with the BBC and the Open University. Visit bbc.co.uk forward slash electric dreams. And Electric Dreams concludes on Tuesday at 9. Next tonight on BBC4, brand new drama tells the story of two Brits who battled it out in the race to corner the UK's rapidly expanding home computing market. Chris Curry and Clive Sinclair go head-to-head -head in Micromen. <laughs>